morning, YouTube. This video is going to serve as a response to three YouTube users who responded to Veritas 48 Dial Films and my request for arguments against the existence of God. Now, specifically, Pelagorum, the Zeef, and Prometheus was right, argued for two main contentions against God via science. Namely, one, science is a superior method of discovery which invalidates theological claims demonstrably via incompatible truth claims, and two, the ground for inferring God as the explanation of certain phenomena or explanations has gradually eroded until all we have is left are God of the gaps arguments. I'm going to offer some thoughts to both contentions. Now interestingly, before we delve into these two specific horns, I'm going to call them horns, not really horns, of the argument from science, we must note that in order for there to be an argument from science, two important facts must obtain. First note that the objector must grant that both science and theology make propositional statements that claim to be true. If one argues that theological statements are not propositional statements claiming to be true, then the objector cannot use this argument. Second, note that the objector also must grant that science and theology do not operate in differing domains or levels. So in other words, in order for there to be a conflict between science and theology, they must interact via some model that does not treat them as polar opposites. I raise these two preliminary considerations as sometimes objectors who use science versus God's existence are not consistent with these background assumptions and in these cases should be ignored for internal inconsistency in their objections. Moreover, it seems almost impossible to outright disprove God through science. One may be able to disprove certain theological claims, but one should not equate the, po the possibility of that with the outright disproof of God. How the argument from science should instead be used is to cast probabilistic doubt on God as an explanation. However, below I hope to argue as to why this approach to the argument does not obtain in casting significant doubt against God's existence. And in addition to this video, I've linked a past video that I've done on this topic. So please take a look at that. Now, that being said, I'd like to address the two horns, again, they're not horns, that the three aforementioned YouTubers um, raised via the argument from science in reverse order. Starting with the second contention, I'd like to argue that inferring God as an explanation for phenomena are not necessarily God of the gaps arguments. Consider the following four arguments. First, in order for the progress to be made via the scientific method, previous invalidated theories must be discarded and remade for new data to arrive. This means that revolutions or new ideas sometimes reopen scientific issues previously thought to be settled. Now, since there is no guarantee that alleged closed gaps will stay closed in light of the constant evolving nature of scientific discovery, closed gaps in our current understanding in no way grant strong evidence that the God of the gaps reasoning is being employed. Rather, closed gaps may very well be unstable launching platforms for new ideas. Second, it is not at all clear that theological propositions are being sequestered into gaps in our knowledge in some sort of devious, disingenuous way. For example, the governing laws, constants, and initial conditions of the universe may be best explained by fine-tuning adjustments. Now, the theistic sympathies that such a discovery raises becomes more pronounced the more we know about gnomic structures, incredibly tight, constrained natural constants, and so forth. Quite contrary to the God of the Gaps argument, the fine-tuning argument comes about via the more we learn instead of resting in gaps of our knowledge. The same can be said of the beginning of the universe via discoveries that support Big Bang cosmology. The Kalam argument is supported by what we know or at least have strong evidence to infer, not by resting in gaps in our knowledge. Finally, consider the gaps in our knowledge when it comes to explaining purpose, no normativity, and intentionality merely in naturalistic terms. These properties of the mental are logically incompatible with physical categories. Thus it is via what we know about the nature of mental states and not gaps in our understanding where arguments from consciousness emerge. Concisely, it is not at all clear that theology always sequesters into gaps in our understanding as evidenced by the three examples above. Third, in some cases, the gaps in our understanding are not getting better, but worse with the advance of science. For example, given the recent findings on the complexity of the organic material necessary for life and their complex independence and order, and the more we learn about the conditions on the early Earth, the more implausible a strictly naturalistic account of the original life becomes. Thus, to object that science covers gaps in our understanding and knowledge while the theology is in full retreat is in no way clear or exemplifiable. 
Fourth and finally, even if we granted that science was shrinking the gaps in our knowledge, it would simply beg the question to argue that just because most, most alleged gaps turned out to be explained in naturalistic terms, then all alleged gaps will turn out this way. Turning to the first horn, the argument from science stated that the method of science is a superior method of discovery, which in turn invalidates theological claims demonstrably via incompatible truth claims between the two methods. Now consider the following four arguments against such a claim. First, this argument rests in scientism, which I have argued against elsewhere and it will be linked in the description. Second, granting that many scientists historically were religious believers, we would have to attribute intellectual blindness, self-deception, or hypocrisy to the scientists who missed this fundamental superiority between science and theology. Suggesting that Galileo, Newton, Kepler, and or Faraday, for example, were simply imperceptive or religious hypocrites violates the historical evidence to the contrary. These men did not hold science as superior to theology. Moreover, we cannot just let these scientists off the hook either by claiming that the specific scientific facts and theories that generated problems today were not known in their day, for the objection states that conflicts flowed out of the very structure and necessary and superior presuppositions of the scientific project itself. Third, following Del Ratch, any science-based case against the rationality of theology must presume the rational justification of science itself which includes science's foundational presuppositions, those being the uniformity of nature, the trustworthy of our memory, the trustworthy of our senses, etc. However, science itself cannot straightforwardly establish the legitimacy of the foundations upon which itself rests. So if one wants to argue that science is superior to theology, then the foundational principles upon which science itself rests must be simply accepted on brute faith. Otherwise, science's foundational presuppositions must obtain rational strength elsewhere, but if this route is taken, two things ensue. First, science is no longer the exclusive or superior source of rational justification, as theology could also voice persuading reasons to hold to the reliability of our senses or the truth-seeking nature of our cognitive fac faculties in a loving creator. And second, how does the naturalist avoid circular reasoning in attempting justification for the adequacy of our cognitive faculties that does not rely on those cognitive faculties? Therefore, I find it hard to believe that science is in any way superior to other methods of discovery of truth, whether that be theology, history, or philosophy. Fourth and lastly, even if we were to grant that there was genuine irresolvable conflict between scientific discovery and God's existence, this would only disprove God if we grant the epistemic priority of science, which is problematic for the above reasons and the following additional reasons summed here. 1. Given the evolving nature of scientific discovery, we should not overlook the strong possibility that scientific beliefs might change in the future. 2. The cognitive faculties and intuitions underlying science are not exclusive to the scientific method, but underlie other human projects and methods as well. If, then, there is any deep conflict between science and religion, each side may rest upon fundamental claims held by each method. And three, the implications of inconsistency are not always straightforward, even within science itself. For example, general relativity and quantum mechanics are both mathematically inconsistent with each other, yet science will not part with either. So if inconsistency is a huge problem, science should start looking at the inconsistencies it holds with the theories it has. Peace.